today on a peaceful edition of Fixing the Money Thing. Let me tell you what God can do. Let me show you what God has done. Let me tell you there's answers for your problem. Let me tell you there's an answer in life for life's problems. Let me witness to you about the power in the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus. People need to see the power of God in this generation. They need to see not the religious God, they need to see the power of God. Now, from Faith Life Church, Gary Cassie and his total peace message, you need the good news. I'm Gary Cassie, and for nine years, we lived in a financial, chaotic, stress-filled, visionless life. I cried out to God. He said, you're living like many of my people are, living in debt. He said, I want my people free. Your financial freedom is closer than you think. America's financial coach, Gary Cassie, shares the kingdom principles that changed his life, defeated his debt, and set him free. Financial problems, they're slow death. We're trying to change the way you think about money. This is Gary Cassie, Fixing the Money Thing. And uh, we're going to talk about some good news today, okay? Good news of the kingdom, right? And so glad to have you today. Acts chapter 10, get your Bibles out, get your ink pens, pens, whatever you write with, iPads, iPhones. But uh, you need to pay close attention today. Uh, we did talk a couple weeks ago about Jesus going around and healing. I want to pick that scripture up, Acts 10, 38. Let's dig into that. Jesus uh, was anointed by God uh, with the Holy Spirit and with what? Power. Say that with me, power. power. And how he went around doing good and healing. All, all right, say it, say it, say it. All. all right, all, there you go. He healed them all, all right? Understand that healing was a major signature of Jesus' ministry, Amen. Now, I want to just set something here. It says, healing all who are under the power, the dominion of the enemy, under the devil. Satan is your enemy. The Bible says he goes around and roars like a lion, seeking whom he may devour, right? He is your enemy. This is a personal enemy. You need to be aware of him. His motive is to kill, steal, and destroy, and to lie. The Bible says he is a liar and the father of lies. There is no truth in him. That's what the Bible says. Jesus said that. So you need to be aware of what's happening. Now, in Luke chapter 13, I want to pick a story up here as well on the Sabbath. This is verse number 10. On the Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman is there who had been crippled by a spirit. By a what? Spirit. By a spirit. By a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over, could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leaders said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. How crazy is that, right? The Lord said to him, uh, You hypocrites, doesn't each one of you um, on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it to give it water? Listen to verse 16. Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bounder? When he said this, all of his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Now, the Bible says 18 long years. That's a long time. And he said, why shouldn't she be healed? You see, she's a daughter of Abraham. That's a legal term. She had legal rights to be healed. She was a daughter of Abraham. She had the covenant of healing. Even in the Old Testament, they had a covenant of healing. And she had a legal right to be healed, but 18 long years, Jesus said, wait a minute, she has a right to be healed. Do you understand? How long do you want to wait? Let me say it again. Let me ask you a question. How long do you want to wait? She didn't have to wait 18 years. You don't have to wait 18 years, right? All right, you'll get this now. All right. But notice it says that she was bound by the devil. So we see by a spirit of infirmity. Now we see here that sickness and disease in both these stories we read today is by the enemy. It mentions the enemy was the source of that, right? right. Need to know this. All right. Now going to Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Of course we know Jesus was anointed with power. Who can tell me when he was anointed with power? 
Tell me where it happened at. At the, at the River Jordan. Previous to that, he could not split his bath water, multiply his, his oatmeal. He was just a normal person. The Bible says Jesus gave up his, his glory. He came as a man to pay the price of Adam. But something happened at the River Jordan. The Holy Spirit came on him with power. And he launched that ministry because it was God with him, the Bible says. He was able to do good and heal them all because, what? God was with him. And when that Holy Spirit came upon him, the power of God himself was basically, you can just look at, he just carried God around with him. That's what he came on him. He just carried God around. See, God's just waiting for a human vessel to carry him around here and let him do his work. Jesus himself said, it's not me that does the work, it's my Father. And that's what God's looking for, is a human being on the earth to carry his power around and let him do what he wants to do. Now, let's look at Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, speaking of power. And Jesus said to stay in Jerusalem, right? Remember, he told them, stay in Jerusalem, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I think Ohio is probably at the ends of the earth, probably. <laughs> Some people think that for sure. Anyway, you shall receive power. Who's he talking to? The church. You shall receive. That's right, you. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then you're able to do the witness demonstrations of the power of God. What, is a, what does a witness do, by, my friend? What does a witness do? Testifies. testifies. In a courtroom, he testifies of what? The things he's seen. Things he knows, right? And so the Bible says the church is ordained to testify of the kingdom of God. That means to bring witness. Bring witness to a world that's looking for answers. Bring witness that there are answers. You follow me? to bring witness. Let me tell you what God can do. Let me show you what God has done. Let me tell you there's answers for your problem. Let me tell you there's an answer in life for life's problems. Let me witness to you about the power in the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus. That's what the church is called to do, right? To bear witness of this kingdom. Well, Jesus is not here in the flesh anymore, but he left you, the body of Christ, and he has given you that same power and that same authority to bear witness and testify of the power of the kingdom of God. Amen anytime now. That's all. Just help me out now. But the bottom line is people are hungry for, the, for, for answers. And the, the point is I believe the church has left this part aside. In fact, it's, it's, it's proper doctrine in some churches that these things have passed away. That these things ended with the apostles. That miracles don't happen today. And, of course, the greatest thing is we're all going to heaven. The name of Jesus brings salvation. That is the greatest thing. But what draws people to hear Jesus? What drew them to him when he walked the earth? What drew the crowds? It wasn't another religious meeting. They had the Pharisees. They had the Sadducees. They had all the religious meetings they wanted. What drew the crowds to Jesus when he was on the earth? It was the signs and wonders, the miracles of God. I would attest to today, my friend, that the, church, the, the people are still looking for those same kind of answers. People are still hungry for answers for real problems. I'm, I'm just telling you from experience, I've had a lot of real problems in my life, and I thank God I knew the answer. <laughs> Your assignment, if you don't know what it is, we are to spoil Satan's kingdom, to render it useless and of no effect to those who will believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, to bear witness of the power of God. And to tell people there is deliverance and freedom and salvation and healing and the good life. There are answers in the body of Christ, right? I had gone to the doctor and found out that I had um, a polyp that needed removed and ended up being a big deal. And they said, um, you have stage four cancer and here's what we recommend. And so one of it was doing chemo for six months and then um, see what happens after that. While I was in that process is when I would be laying on the couch resting. After chemo treatments, I would be exhausted and then started watching Fixing the Money thing. I was looking on Christian TV and started listening and I'm like, this is 
This is what we've been looking for. A year previous to her having her bout with her health issues, I felt that one morning God told me I'm to have a kingdom business, and I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about because I thought it was God's business, but it kept coming back that I am to have a kingdom business. When she started listening to Pastor Gary and I would come home from work, she said, this is what God is saying about a kingdom business. I literally had stopped dreaming. I had dreams in my heart that I'd just given up because, well, when you're just on the hamster wheel and you're working as hard as you can and nothing's really changing, how are you gonna dream for anything more? And that's exactly where we were. I hated debt and so I would have just loved to find a way to fix this money thing. Just a title caught my attention. And then when I heard he was in New Albany and, you know, it was like, there's a possibility here. This is our 27th year in business as an excavating business. And our business is always seasonal. It slows down in the winter time. And we always struggled with even making payroll and things like that during January, February, March, when winter was at its worst. And so when we started listening to Pastor Gary and the things that he would say, we just felt like, man, this is, this is something that we really have to get connected to. Like Gary says, you gotta be a spiritual scientist and, and dig for yourself and find why or whatever. And I remember I, I read the scriptures and would take the scriptures that he would teach with and I would, I would look them up and see if he was right. And all made sense to me. One of the biggest things we've learned is the authority that God has given us in the earth realm. That's what we were lacking was the knowledge of the authority that we actually have in the earth realm. When I went back for a checkup after I had gone through all my chemo and was kind of over that and went back for a checkup, the doctor looked at me, shook his head, and he said, I am amazed. There is absolutely no evidence of any disease in your body. We came to the provision conference and from there it just grew from there. We were so hungry and wanted so much to learn more about these principles because if it's the kingdom, why we want it. And we knew about the kingdom, but we didn't understand the kingdom. I think it was in 18 when we went to Pastor Gary's Financial Revolution Conference in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And while we were on the way down, one of our guys had an accident with one of the trucks. So we there had the opportunity to sow a seed. And we sowed a seed, and this was in the middle of winter. This was in January. We went on to Florida for vacation then, and before we came home, we had the cash to buy a very good used truck just like what we needed for the business. And that was our first big experience, experience with, with sowing a seed and seeing a harvest very quickly, even in the middle of winter. And that was very, very unusual for our business and for us to experience. We've always been tithers. We've always tithed, but we didn't understand what it means to sow a seed and expect a harvest. And we grew up as farmers' kids, and we didn't understand that, but. It's been a family business with mm -hmm. one or two other people coming in to help us. So we're just a small family business. But as we have learned these kingdom principles, our, we've just seen our profit margins go way up and just uh, blessed with good jobs that are profitable. There's fresh opportunity out there, and I keep hearing God say, "Stay, just stay on assignment. Just stay on assignment. You know, walk in what you've been made to do, and you just live it out. People will see the difference. And and who doesn't want different when it's better? Wouldn't you prefer prospering versus being in poverty? And that's I think that's God's heart. I thank God for fixing the money thing because that's, that was hope for us. 
Well, Jesus said this. This is an interesting scripture. Matthew 16, 18, he says this. I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock, what is the rock? Not Peter. The rock is the revelation that he's the Christ. On that rock, he is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the cornerstone. He is Jesus. On that rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So many people in the church have this reversed. They think the gates of hell is talking about the power of the devil's kingdom. Actually, the gates of hell, what do the gates do in your front yard? The gates are defensive, not on the offense. You put walls up and gates up to stop people from stealing, right? But the Bible says the gates of hell, his defenses have been destroyed and torn down. He has no defense. This is not an indication or a, a contribution to give you an insight of how great the devil is. It's talking about how great his kingdom is. Amen. And the gates of hell, his defenses are down. Go take territory. Yes. Get the people out of there. Yes. Tell them the good news. Yes. He has no defenses. He has no authority. Guess who has it? Jesus took it from him and gave it to you. He says, all authority has been given unto me. Now go. All authority has been given unto me on heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. He always had it in heaven, but when he defeated the devil, he took earth. He says, now all authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. Now you go. Give you the same deputy. He deputized you. He anointed you to go out there and do it, right? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that's the devil. That part's over with, friend. That's a done deal, right? But let me review your marching orders, Mark 16. This is your assignment. Mark 16 is a direction of of intent, if you will. It's, it's It's your instructions. Jesus spoke these words as he was leaving his disciples and uh, giving, giving them very good instruction on what to do. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. What's the first word? Well, that's the beginning part. He didn't say stay in your houses and tremble in fear. He didn't say go buy all the toilet paper you can buy. You're going to need it, man. Bury your, you know, you're not... He, he didn't say, he didn't say, now there's, there's wisdom. I'm making some fun, okay? There's wisdom, all right? I'm, I'm not saying there's not wisdom. But the bottom line is, he says, go. Go where? Into the world. And tell them what? The what? The good news. Now that's the church's assignment, right? Go tell them, preach the good news to every creation, all creation, all, every, everyone, everywhere. And whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name or in my authority, they will do it. Number one, drive out demons. You have an assignment. Drive them out. From my personal experience, they don't leave unless you drive them out. You say, well, no, those third world nations, they have a lot of demons. No, there's, there's a lot here, if not more here in the United States. Demons are real, my friend. I've seen them personally. They're real. And you don't want to mess with them. You want to kick them out. You want to drive them out. But you have the authority to do that. When I say that, and I'll go, oh, 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 demons. That's what they say about you. Oh, oh, stay away. You know, listen, friend, you got to wake up, man. You got to figure this thing out. The devil's a liar. He's tried to intimidate you. You have all the goods. You have the authority and the power, right? We read that. Drive the demons out. Number two, what does it say? They shall speak in new tongues. Now, this is interesting because this is your marching orders. And tongues, speaking in tongues, is one of the nine spiritual gifts written in Corinthians. So why did Mark only list that one? Because if you take note of these four instructions here, they all deal with power and taking territory. Because he's giving marching orders to the troops. That's the church. He's telling them, this is what I want you to do. Go into the world and preach the good news. And I want you to exercise my authority and cast demons out. And then he says, you'll need to speak in tongues. Basically, he's saying, you'll need need a radio. 
If you're in the military, you need to hear from the high command. Because the command, the high command has the bird's eye view of the battlefield. He knows, he can see by satellite what the enemy's doing. You don't have satellite right there on the front line. you got to have him tell you, this is what's happening. I need you to take the left flank. Right? And so when we pray in tongues, speak in tongues, you say, well, my church doesn't believe that. Change churches then. <laughs> because it's right here. This is, Jesus said, you need this equipment. And if you don't have all the equipment, it would be like going into battle without your rifle. I need all this equipment to be successful in my mission. And to be successful in your mission, you need to know what I'm talking about. And I know what you're saying. I grew up in a church that taught that speaking in tongues was of the devil. I wonder who taught that lie. Since it's in 1 Corinthians 13, they all have it on their walls. Though I speak in tongues of men and of angels. Right there in the love chapter, it's on everyone's walls. Right? It's in all the Bible. Why is it there? You need to understand why it's there. Why is it here? Because if you follow this in 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 2, Paul says those that pray in tongues pray out mysteries out of their spirit. Now, if you're in battle, one thing you need to know is what you don't know. <laughs> right? So praying out mysteries, that's pretty valuable. And then it goes down in verse number 4. It says... And those who pray in tongues edify themselves. The word edify in the dictionary means instruction. How many would agree you need instruction in battle? Yes. You would need to know what to do. Yes. If, for instance, if you owe taxes, Jesus said, go catch a fish. You'll find a coin in its mouth. Who would have thought of that? I need some instruction, right? Or go over there and catch fish in the deep water. Where are they at in the deep water, right? Well, we fished all night, caught nothing, because over there in the deep water, right? You need to have instruction. God knows a few things. He knows a few things you need to know in battle, right? Right? Come on. And so praying in tongues is invaluable. That's why it's the only one of the nine spiritual gifts listed in this paragraph of your marching orders. Next, what comes in the list? Number three, what's in the list? Next. Come on, help me out. Pick up snakes with your hands. Now, this is indicating something very intense. You're going to walk right in there, unafraid, in the devil's territory, and this is hand-to-hand -hand combat, and you're not nervous about it one bit. Well, pastor, if I lay hands on someone, I might get sick. Well, if you believe that, don't do it, because you're not in faith. But the Bible says you have authority over that thing, that spirit of infirmity. Yes. Now, picking up snakes, he's not talking about the old Appalachia snake handling, you know, <laughs> churches. There have been churches that did that. But the bottom line, in that era, they had poisonous snakes. And they knew without a doubt, I'm not touching that thing. That's a poisonous snake. And what he's saying is, basically, the enemy has no authority over you. Amen. He cannot harm you. We can trample Trample on scorpions and serpents, and nothing by any means shall harm you. That's what, that's what the Bible says. Jesus said that, yes. Luke chapter 10. And so then it says, if you drink anything deadly, it shall not harm you. Something undercover. Now, you can pick up a snake with your hand. You can see it. But the enemy, he tries a few tricks. He tries to slip things in you don't see. And even if that happens, in other words, you may not be aware of drinking something poisonous, Correct. The enemy might try to pull a few snares on you, something you haven't seen happen, something you're not aware of, something called a virus that you can't see, possibly something that you, you know, he says it shall not harm you. Right. Now this is, this is by faith, but this is who you are. Do you understand? I've given you power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witness. You have the power of God, the authority of God, and this is your marching orders right here. Because people need to see the power of God in this generation. They need to see not the religious God, they need to see the power of God.